Thanks, Nadia. Mm. When I went through this with Leon um, the other day, I was this. I actually stopped at the very first slide, and I was completely lost. Um, usually, you can get through the one which just says the title of what you're talking about, who you are, and what you're doing. Um, but I realized I had, had these two different things on here. One is, is my role as a PhD student at Massey University. And the other one is really what I am here for today. My supervisor's not here, Shiv, who's the, the other keynote. Um, the PhD did pay for me to come up here, but I kind of feel like I'm certainly not talking about what my PhD is about. I'm talking about my role as an activist with the Doing Our Bit campaign which I have entitled Doing a Megabyte, in that we're talking today, well, I'm talking today about a reflection on the efficacy of social media within this campaign. Um, yeah, I, I knew I would turn up here and see a lot of people I know and like from a number of years around New Zealand, um, from people uh, from Otago, where I did my undergraduate study, I'm from Victoria at Wellington, people from Massey, and so it's really great to be in this room full of people who I know from various persuasions, from academic places, from activist places, uh, sometimes from artistic places. Um, so it's, yeah, really satisfying to be here. So thanks, Ozan, for bringing us together and for everyone else who had a hand in, in this. Um, hmm. So the aim of what I'm doing is, is sort of at at a bit of a turning point in the campaign. I'll explain what the campaign is in just a moment. Um, it's just a, a point to reflect, to evaluate three viewpoints that have sort of cobbled together on the efficacy of social media for influencing public policy um, through this Doing Our Bit campaign. Um, on to social media. People, I guess most people here have some social media accounts. It would be kind of useful. You can put up your hand if you've got a Facebook account. Um, you can put up your hand if you don't have one. And Twitter, who's got a Twitter account? Quite a few. And those who don't have Twitter? Lots. So I really hated Facebook for a long time. And then my friend created a fake page for me using a picture of Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. And I was compelled to take over that Facebook page in about 2011. But I really hated it, and I had no use for it, and I was, um, I was even really snobby about the value of it. Um, Twitter was the same thing. I thought, well, what's Twitter for? It's um, a waste of time. Uh, but then the communications advisor who helped me a little bit with this, he asked me how my Twitter account was going. <laughs> and I sort of looked at him and I was like, well, yeah, you know, nice and then us coming together. Um, so I had to make one. Um, so doing our bit is a campaign to double New Zealand's refugee resettlement quota and funding. I don't want to explain too much about it today, but there's a few kind of key points about the refugee resettlement quota. One, it has, hasn't grown since it was made in 1987. In 1987, the quota was formalized at 800 places. Uh, in 1997, the national government said, OK, we'll pay for your airfares to come here, uh, but we're going to cut the quota to 750 places. So it's been 27 years without an increase. Uh, the second point is New Zealand ranks at 87th in the world at hosting refugees per capita. That's mainly because refugees can't get here. We're in fact the only country in the world where more people come in via the quota system than come in irregularly as asylum seekers. We're the only country in the world. It's because of basically our isolation. There's only about seven or eight countries that really take the quota seriously. Most other people accept refugees through the asylum seeker system, which is an asylum seeker turns up, says, hey, I'm an asylum seeker. Um, I'm at risk of persecution. Please give me a place to live. And then finally, I tacked on this doubling of the refugee resettlement uh, funding because this is an issue that's really important to people who actually work with refugees and NGOs in New Zealand. Um, I liked what Nadia was having to say, and I wrote something down to refer to about the aim of not duplicating um, the advocacy work. In New Zealand, we have a large group of people doing awesome work with refugees in New Zealand, but the aim of this campaign wasn't to do what they're doing, wasn't to do it, more, uh, wasn't to do it better or more radical. It was to focus on a political issue which they couldn't really speak about because of the need for neutrality 
um, particularly for government-funded organizations. And they're all suffering under national. Um, they were suffering under labor, too. They're suffering more now. Uh, so this was the basis of the campaign, um, asking the question, are we doing our bit, colloquializing it as doing our bit. Um, I use basically three approaches to try and get this campaign to double the refugee quota and funding. So the first one was an art exhibition based on a thousand photos of Afghan refugees who were imprisoned in Iran that I found in Iran. I was in Iran almost, it was actually, it was five years ago to pretty much right now. I was traveling through Iran, I found an abandoned prison. Uh, it had been abandoned in 2005. I went in and there were documents there with photographs of Afghan refugees. There was about 10,000 photographs and I took 1,000 of them out of the country, and those were the ones with families, uh, like this. And you can see the staples piercing through as a sort of the aesthetic of administration. Uh, maybe you can see why I couldn't leave these in the dust in this prison. Um, so this was the first thing that sparked my interest in the refugee quota and refugees in New Zealand. So this art exhibition kind of came together, and I was trying to justify my relationship to these people, to these images, the people in these images, um, which is yeah, basically how I came to feeling the need to respond by seeing what New Zealand actually did for refugees. So then the second approach I used was a social media campaign, and that's what I'll be looking at today, utilizing Facebook and Twitter. And then the third one was what I'll be contrasting that with in terms of the efficacy of social media, and that was lobbying of politicians and the public, including emails, uh, official Information Act requests, a website, and op-eds. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, a website, emails, this is social media. Well, it's kind of is. Well, actually, no, it's not. It definitely isn't. It's digital media. So we've got this differentiation, kind of a basic one between digital media and social media. Social media, basic definition, is any web-based application that allows the creation and exchange of user-generated content. So all social media comes about in a digital media context, but some digital media, like email, is not social media. Sort of makes sense. It's, it's stuff that's in the public or semi-public, like Facebook and Twitter are. Uh, hmm. There's obviously some interrelationship between the two, and we'll see those in the three views on the efficacy of social media for activism. So the, these are ones that I came through when my PhD was initially going to look at social media and digital media, but it's kind of dropped that now. And so they're slightly tentative. Um, so it would be good to hear some criticisms of them today. Um, I do intend to write on this. So yeah, they're definitely not set in stone, and they're, not, they're just sort of formulations I've come up with. So one notion of the efficacy of social media for activism is a sort of Castell's line, which says social media, overall, it functions at, as a democratizing all. Overall, more or less, it helps people to talk to, another, to one another, it enables you to communicate, more communication, better democracies. Second one is opposed to this. It still sees it as a functionalist thing. It functions well, but overall as a repressive force. And this is how Morozov looks at the role of the internet with authoritative regimes. Does anyone, does anyone know that Onion article, The Onion's a satirical website, where they talk about... Um, the CIA inventing Facebook and how great it was for the CIA that everyone would just give them all the information. <laughs> this is kind of what we're talking about here. The social media is this place where people just kind of put all this information, and particularly in authoritarian regimes, but also in less authoritarian regimes like New Zealand. Um, overall, it functions that way. Then the third one is one that I struggled to really articulate when I practiced this with Leon the other day. This is Jody Dean's idea in her um, sort of critique of communicative capitalism, that social media gives the illusion of functioning as a democ democratic force, but there's really little effect from it. So social media creates this sort of, or functions in, as basically this drive that compels people to communicate with one another and to feel like they're being active or activists. Uh, but at the same time, it, that sort of surplus of communication leaves politicians to do their policy work in the space that is wholly outside of social media. Um, so that's at least, I don't know. I mean, this is, I, I feel it's different from Morozov's argument. 
it's based more on a Lacanian notion that it's um, that things aren't so rational in our reading. So yeah. Gee, how am I doing for time? Yep. Uh, still have time, like ten minutes. Ten. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so basically, I'm at this point in the doing our bit campaign where um, we've had we've had some successes, and the elections coming up. Every, I know what every party is sort of promising to do, and um, I'm sort of at a point where not much can be done until we find out how the next government's going to react to the policy. So I thought it'd be a good time to anatomize the campaign, that is, to cut it up, um, to dissect it, to see what was going on, or just to evaluate it. Um, so as a democratizing force, there was definitely, like, it was definitely useful, social media, if only to, I don't know, it's, it's so hard to quantify exactly the influence. So some of the success we had, for example, the Labour Party at the 2011 election, they said our policy on the refugee quota is to review our policy on the refugee quota. Um, their policy now is to increase it to 1,000 places, uh, which makes up for population growth since 1987. Uh, that's not doubling the quota, but it is, it is a concrete success, which we were hoping for but didn't necessarily expect. And part of social media's use there was we aim to have 1,000 likes on our page on Facebook. We aim to have 1,000 followers on Twitter. And we saw that as a legitimizing factor, but we have really no idea if Darian Fenton or Trevor Mallard or whoever actually made the decision in the Labour Party that they would change the quota if that influenced them. We saw the use of it, uh, when I say we, I, I did have uh, some help from some friends, uh, more on just sort of spreading the message out through social media, but also through strategy. Um, yeah, so, so it was quite confusing whether, whether those pages, whether the effort we put into Facebook or Twitter really had that much of an effect. Um, it was certainly useful to bypass the typical gatekeepers for talking to politicians. Um, there's quite a bit of ego tied up in Judith Collins's Twitter page, if people have followed her. Um, so much so that she was forced to stop using it for a while. Um, we had a really great weekend where I asked everyone who wanted to help if they would friend the Minister of Immigration, Michael Woodhouse, on Facebook. And looking at his page, it was just littered with new friends um, accepted from all these people I knew. And we were able to use that to post things on his page directly and to really capture his attention in a way that traditional media struggles to. Um, of course, at the same time, some of their best successes to get meetings with people was simply sending an email. New Zealand's kind of a small place. If you have a bit of an argument and it's not too much against their, their worldview, they might meet with you, particularly if they're in opposition. So it was very difficult to quantify social media as opposed to these other forms of digital media, asking questions, simply just sending a Monday morning email and someone's press secretary gets back to you. Uh, as a repressive force, certainly the long-term outcomes are unknown. W what I'm doing is not um, revolutionary. It's a simple adjustment to policy that can be justified through population inflation. So in terms of what Morozov was looking at in the wider sphere of the internet, I can't imagine the SIS is going to bust into my house and confiscate my memes about why we need to double the quota by appealing to David Longy in 1987. Um, that said, the, you know, there could be other approaches to increasing the refugee quota, um, which, we didn't, which I didn't attempt. Uh, there could be furtive assisting of asylum seekers when I was... I had the flu one time, and I was, you know, the delirium that sometimes accompanies that. I thought of using my parents' boat to go to Indonesia and bring um, a bunch of asylum seekers over. We'd perform the same tool. But, I mean, this was one of the problems with the campaign. There's no DIY approach. You have to talk to politicians. You have to deal with them if you want um, New Zealand to be better, to, hold, to do its bit for refugees. So, yeah, as a repressive force, these are sort of things that might play out in the long term, but Morozov's sort of reading for this campaign didn't really hold true. 
Uh, finally, as an illusionary force. Um, yeah. I, there certainly there was value to it. Uh, Jody Dean's reading of, of social media, she's pretty polemically against it. Um, but there were certain moments just where someone, <laughs> someone liking something, um, so the sort of sustained interest from other people, people sharing things, people retweeting. Um, the best tweet we had was retweeted by 38 people. And even if it doesn't mean anything, it's a sign of solidarity, those kind of sad moments where you're thinking, what a waste of time, no one's listening. It's just this constant drip of affirmation. Um, so Jody Dean sort of didn't like that because that gives the illusion of progress. Uh, but if you're a little skeptical about the efficacy of social media, then hopefully it does something good for you as well. Um, it certainly assisted with the visibility and contacting people, um, but again, it's hard to measure the efficacy of it. There was one really great moment um, that showed sort of the disdain that politicians have for social media and the influence of it. When, uh, if people remember the Donghua Liu um, saga where he donated a bunch of money to the Cabinet Club, $10,000 to speak to the Minister of Immigration, in Parliament that day, uh, Holly Walker asked some questions along those lines. And then she asked, well, Mr. Woodhouse, if it's so easy for you to talk to people, why haven't you talked to Murdoch Stevens, who's running the Doing Our Bit campaign, <laughs> when he didn't pay you $10,000? And he said, oh, well, we've had an awful lot of contact on social media. <laughs> and everyone laughed about it and, and kind of made fun of him for thinking social media was the equivalent of actually having a meeting with someone. Um, just to return to the, the possibility that it does have some function, there was another uh, little moment that I'd like to end on, which was um, in that same discussion, uh, Woodhouse uh, had said, well, uh, yeah, I don't recall, I don't recall him ever asking for a meeting. And then the next day he was interviewed uh, on a thing called Vote Chat with Bryce Edwards at Otago University asking about immigration policy. And um, I had been tweeting to Bryce Edwards beforehand saying, hey Bryce, can you ask him about doubling the quota? It hasn't increased in 27 years. New Zealand's 87th in the world for hosting. And he included that in his questions to Michael Woodhouse. And he also included, so why haven't you met him? You said you'd meet, you'd meet anyone. He didn't pay, why didn't you meet him? And Woodhouse said, well, I went back to my office last night and uh, we searched through our emails and nothing. He hasn't requested a meeting. And so I was watching this on a live feed in my bedroom. And so I grabbed um, a, screen, a screen grab of my emails, the two emails I'd sent to him, and tweeted those to the producer of Vote Chat. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, they went to the producer, and every now and then the producer looks to Twitter and says, well, what happened on Twitter? The producer says, well, if you look on the screen here, and I put it up on a big screen, it had my email to Michael Woodhouse saying, can I have a meeting with you? And then it had the other one. And it was just this beautiful moment where the technology of social media was able to, in real time, catch a politician in, in a really, really ugly way. <laughs> but he, he handled it pretty well <laughs> after that. I think that's pretty much all. So the evaluation is, I don't know. Uh, there's some nice moments of solidarity. It's certainly not the answer, it's a tool that you use to connect to people. Um, it's worked, I think, quite well for this. But on the whole, you don't want to put all your eggs in that basket. Thanks. Uh, any questions?